During biological evolution, a species may develop certain traits that give it a survival advantage against its competition. However, most advantageous traits come with certain caveats or disadvantages. Human intelligence is one such trait. Our brains, which are relatively large compared to other species, give us exceptionally developed cognitive capabilities, allowing us to gain and preserve new insights about the natural world. This increased brain capacity has come at the cost of larger heads, which poses a serious danger for women during childbirth. Evolution's solution to this problem is that human infants are born relatively underdeveloped compared to other primates, and, as a result, we are dependent upon others for a relatively long time. This extended period of dependency also comes with a secondary disadvantage. Being dependent upon others reduces the need to become self-reliant and mature, and so many youth tend to cling on to childhood, even as they enter adolescence. Human societies are dependent upon its members becoming competent, and so important cultural strategies have developed in order to facilitate the transition from childhood into adulthood. Nearly every archaic society possesses some form of initiation ritual, with the intended purpose of transforming the child from his blissful existence into adulthood, and the responsibilities that accompany maturity. The need to initiate the youth is also a consequence of the fact that the cognitive evolution of humans has generated a body of information which must be passed on to the next generation. As Anthony Stevens writes, With the evolution of culture, initiation rituals apparently became necessary because individual willingness to submit to the demands and disciplines of outer reality is not something which occurs automatically with the normal processes of growth. Initiation rituals are a religious phenomenon, which often involve invoking supernatural entities, and it is important to note the profound psychological effects such rituals have upon the participant. Nearly all primitive societies believe that the sacred knowledge they possess was given to them by their gods, and it is their responsibility to ensure that this knowledge is passed down. The initiation itself is meant to produce a significant psychological transition in the initiate, in which he will no longer be regarded as a child. As Mircha Eliade writes, The term initiation, in the most general sense, denotes a body of rites and oral teachings, whose purpose is to produce a decisive alteration in the religious and social status of the person to be initiated. To gain the right to be admitted among adults, the adolescent has to pass through a series of initiatory ordeals. It is by virtue of these rites, and of the revelations that they entail, that he will be recognized as a responsible member of society. Initiation in primitive cultures has a specific religious meaning. Children in many pre-modern cultures are often not required to directly participate in spirituality, but the initiation marks the point at which the initiate must begin to adopt religion. Since religion and culture are closely bound together, this religious initiation is also a cultural one. Initiation represents one of the most significant spiritual phenomena in the history of humanity. It is an act that involves not only the religious life of the individual, in the modern meaning of the word religion, it involves his entire life. It is through initiation that, in primitive and archaic societies, man becomes what he is and what he should be, a being open to the life of the spirit, hence one who participates in the culture into which he was born. Although there are big differences between the initiation ceremonies of different cultures, there are some commonalities which are worth noting. Initiation occurs for boys and girls, but the customs of the ceremonies differ between them. For girls, initiation is usually closely associated with the onset of puberty. For boys, the goal of initiation is to strengthen their masculinity in order to prepare them for the hardships of life, and it is this type of initiation which we will focus on. The preparation for the initiation involves learning about the tribe's mythical knowledge and the spiritual origins which emphasize the necessity of becoming a man and not relying on others. The psychology of this is described by Anthony Stevens in the following way. Traditionally, boys were prepared for the initiatory ordeal by frequent recitals of tribal myths and legends, which recounted the deeds of heroes of the past. These stories had the teleological function of establishing a gradient along which the masculine libido might flow towards the goal of mature and responsible manhood. In psychological terms, the initiation is meant to pull the child from his psychic inertia and participation in the unconscious 
in order to facilitate and bolster his own sense of self-conscious independence. As Eric Neumann remarks, the initiations enable young men to rise up in the scale and to perform various functions within the group. The trials of endurance are tests of the virility and stability of the ego. They are not to be taken personalistically as the vengeance of the old upon the young, any more than our matriculation is the vengeance of old men upon the rising generation, but merely a certificate of maturity for entering into the collective. Although initiation rituals may sometimes seem cruel and barbaric, in primitive societies they have an important psychological function, upon which the group's survival may depend. They represent a spiritual death and rebirth of the initiate, where his rebirth signifies the death of childhood and the strengthening of the masculine principle. In the initiation rites, the young men are, as it were, swallowed up by the tutelary spirits of this masculine world, and are reborn as children of the spirit, rather than of the mother. They are sons of heaven, not just sons of earth. This spiritual rebirth signifies the birth of the higher man, who even on the primitive level, is associated with consciousness, the ego, and willpower. All of the features of male initiation rituals are geared towards this principle, as they tend to involve symbols which represent the importance of this transition. Fire and other symbols of wakefulness and alertness play an important part in the initiation rites, where the young men have to watch and wake, i.e. learn to overcome the body and the inertia of the unconscious by fighting against tiredness. Keeping awake and the endurance of fear, hunger, and pain go together as essential elements in fortifying the ego and schooling the will. The ritual itself often involves the recreation of an important myth in the tribe's lore. These myths often depict the teleological origins of the world, which, as we have noted in other videos, is actually a psychological allegory depicting the arising of consciousness, usually by representing the splitting off from the maternal unconscious. This makes sense since the goal of initiation is to promote masculine consciousness while eliminating unconscious childlike behavior, and so the participants are required to ritually recreate the mythological origins of the universe. These ceremonies involve ritually depicting the death and rebirth of the initiate to symbolize the death of childhood and the birth of adulthood. The majority of initiatory ordeals more or less clearly imply a ritual death followed by resurrection or a new birth. The central moment of every initiation is represented by the ceremony symbolizing the death of the novice and his return to the fellowship of the living. But he returns to life a new man, assuming another mode of being. Initiatory death signifies the end at once of childhood, of ignorance, and of the profane condition. The initiation ceremony usually begins with the child being separated from his mother to symbolize his need to become independent from her. For instance, the Maring tribes of India represent this in the following way. Covered with blankets, the women sit on the ground with their boys in front of them. At a particular moment, the novices are seized by the men, who come up running, and they run away together. This separation from the mother closely mirrors a common mythological motif which we have discussed elsewhere. The boys may be taken far away, where they are to experience a symbolic death. This sometimes involves painful ordeals, and in extreme cases, some initiates don't survive. Being forced to endure days without food or water is quite common, but even more grueling practices are known. The Yuin, an indigenous Australian tribe, as part of their initiation ceremony, remove an incisor tooth from the initiate using a hammer. Amongst the Pangwe people of Central Africa, the initiate is forced to drink a nauseating brew without vomiting. He is then taken to a house filled with aggressive ants, which repeatedly bite him. These painful ordeals are in part a way to introduce the child to the difficulties of being an adult, and to teach him the importance of resilience while enduring pain. These ordeals may last a single night, or they may continue for several days, as important tribal knowledge and mythology is transferred to the novice. What we have is a break, sometimes quite a violent break, with the world of childhood which is at once the maternal and female world and the child's state of irresponsibility and happiness, of ignorance and asexuality. The break is made in such a way as to produce a strong impression both on the mothers and the novices. These ordeals, which represent the end of infancy, are then followed by the ritual resurrection of the initiate, at which point he is considered an adult and trusted with the tribe's sacred knowledge. He is brought back to the tribe and reintegrated into the group. 
His responsibilities increase, as he is now expected to contribute more to the group's survival. The boys die to their profane condition, and are resuscitated in a new world. For through the revelation they have received during their initiation, they can perceive the world as a sacred work, a creation of the gods. From this point on, the initiates are considered adults, which usually means that they are trusted with more responsibilities, and are expected to contribute more to the group. The survival of the group depends upon having competent adults, who possess the capacity to endure life's difficulties bravely. Modern society has largely been stripped of significant religious initiation rites, with a few exceptions. Many depth psychologists have noted this trend alongside the fact that men in the modern world seem slower to mature and become independent and self-reliant. This alarming trend may be partially responsible for the increasing rates of depression, drug abuse, and suicide experienced by men in the modern world. This is why it is important to be in touch with our archaic roots and to understand the psychological significance of initiation rituals. As Anthony Stevens explains, the virtual disappearance of rites of passage from our own culture has been accompanied by a decline in the importance accorded to sacred ceremonial. Until comparatively recent times, however, rites of passage were customarily linked with supernatural sanctions, which greatly enhanced their sacred potency. From the ethological standpoint, they can be seen as promoting effects which clearly possessed survival value for individual members of a population, and that they contributed powerfully to social cohesiveness. Rites linked the individual to the group, and the group to the individual. They ensured group recognition of, and group participation in, the great events of the individual's life. They heightened his consciousness of the transformation he was undergoing, and they made the transformation more inevitable, more likely to be accomplished, by giving the individual the courage to move on to the next stage ordained for him, and to overcome the regressive tendencies, which might otherwise turn him back towards immature patterns and dependencies, instead of progressing towards greater maturity. Thus, rights ensured the psychiatric health of the individual, as well as of the community.